with that one look this morning at the sun, God just showed me his love. And he showed me the love of the brethren. He showed me, you know, I gave God thanks. I said, Lord, I thank you that I'm part of your body. I thank you that you so love me that you brought me into the family of God. And I have experienced the love of the wider family of God. But brethren, I am so happy that he made me one of you. That he brought me, planted me in this fellowship. I feel the love of the brethren. And yet my heart is filled with love for the brethren in this fellowship. I love you all with the love of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I sense it. I sense the presence of the Lord in my brethren. I sense their love. And I, and I know, you know, sometimes it's, it's a fuzzy feeling. It's not always a fuzzy feeling. Usually it's a commitment to service. And, but I know that my heart leaps when I see the brethren. Leaps for joy. Hallelujah. So there is a bit of a fuzzy feeling. Isn't that wonderful? It's not the fuzzy feeling um, that Leon has for Andrew. But it's a, it's a fuzzy feeling <laughs> nonetheless. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We thank you, Lord. You know, um, what God reminded me as he showed me the love, his love again, is that Jesus in John 13 said to us that we should love each other. He says, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. He says, even as I have loved you, so ought you to love one another. Hallelujah. And the apostles made this a recurrent theme. You'll see where John at least six times in his letters said that we should love the brethren. If we say we love God, we must love the brethren. And Paul picked up that theme as well. But I really like how Peter put it. He says, love one another fervently, fervently, with a pure heart, with a pure heart, love one another. And so, brethren, let us truly love one another in word and in deed this morning as we gather and continue to worship God and to receive from him. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your great love wherewith you have loved us. We thank you, Lord, that love is also expressed within the body of Christ, that we experience in a tangible way your love, Lord. We have seen your hand in our lives, and we bless you for it. We thank you, Lord, that when we gather together, uh, even as we gather to bless you, Lord, it is even more in your heart to bless us. So again, Father, we ask that you would open our hearts that we might receive the blessing this morning. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for that lovely a bit of breeze that's coming from the left of me. Um, and I really give you thanks for that, Lord, that last week <laughs> I didn't work up a sweat up here because it was nice and cool and we'll be doing for another cool morning today. Hallelujah. And we just thank you, Father, that you are going to, you have given me a message. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'd anoint me to deliver it. I pray, Lord, that even my own ears and heart will be open to receiving from you this morning. As you send forth your word, Lord, uh, to be a blessing, Lord, to be uh, transforming, to do a transforming work in all of us. So open the hearts of all of us, Lord, and our ears to receive from you your word, which never returns to you void, your word, which does transform us, and we will worship before you today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. And? Amen. Hallelujah. Let me hear the congregation say amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much. Bless you. Because it says, so let it be, so it is. Amen. So last week, um, I started a message on fulfilling God's call on your life. I did, I think I covered three points from it, of five. And today I want to try and finish the other three. I'll do a little recap. But that message came to me out of my own experience. You know that the vision in Joytown is a large vision. And I am fairly advanced in years, and there's much left to do. And so, you know, I was before God about it, and God spoke to me five points uh, to encourage me in my walk, in fulfilling my call, the call on my life. And I believe, brethren, that if we will embrace these points, uh, I believe it will enable us to ourselves 
fulfill the call, God's call upon our lives. So if I can begin by just quickly recapping the three points from last week. And Brother Winston, I'm going to try and be very quick with it. I could preach a message all over again, but I'll try not to. The first thing that God asked me was, um, does age matter? And his answer to me was, no, it doesn't matter. And he spoke to me out of the life of Moses who, and Aaron. They were 80 and 83 years old at the time when God called them. And they stood before the Pharaoh. And he also reminded me that Abram was 75 when he was called out of Haran and sent into Canaan. And that he spent a lot of his life learning about the Lord. He was 99 before his name was changed from Abram to Abraham and he became the father of nations. He was 100 before the son of promise came and he was substantially older when he came to that moment where he had to, um, where he was tested to, to full obedience before God where he was willing, he had the faith, his faith level was so high, he could slay his son knowing that God had some miracle in store, and God stopped him in the act, the very act of slaying his son. But he made me uh, realize that it's not just the old, but it's for everybody, it's the young. He spoke to me out of the life of Joseph, who was 17, when God gave him a vision of where he would end up. And he was 30 when he started to, re, um, to be governor over Egypt. David was a youth when he was anointed to be king, and he was a youth when he slew Goliath. And he was 30 when he started to reign over Israel in Hebron. And then, of course, he told me about Samuel, who was only a child, when he, he heard God's voice speak to him, and he got a message for the old priest whom he served, Eli. So God just said, age is not the critical thing. What's important is to be serving him throughout the seasons of our lives. All the seasons of our lives. And what is important, as Paul tells us in Philippians 3, is that we should always be pressing forward and upward. Philippians 3, 12 to 14. Always pressing forward and upward. And that's what is important. Know that God is going to use us in all the seasons of our lives. The second thing he said to me was that we must be prepared to serve. Again, he spoke to me out of the life of Moses, and he showed me the seasons in Moses' life as he prepared him. And he spoke to me out of Abram's life and out of Paul's life, and we heard all of that last week. God uses every experience and every season. He's going to use every experience in our life to, in, to equip us to fulfill the call. Um, and I challenge us to think about our own life and where we were in terms of this. What had God been doing in our life? You know, there's some people say, I don't know what God has called me to, But I would say this to you, do what comes to your hand and God will lead you. And it will become clear to you as you walk with God exactly what he has called you to. Some people, some of us do hear very specifically, very early, what he's called us to in each season. Then the third thing he said is that he, whom he calls, he empowers. So he has equipped us, but he also empties us um, in order that we might now transfer our allegiance or our trust from the things we have learned to the living God. And everything that he has put in us, he then uses now to put back, uh, to, uh, we submit it to him, and we use that in his service. But it is under his guidance, and our reliance is not upon our own abilities. And Jesus was very clear when he said, um, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me in, and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. So brethren, what we saw there is that outside of Jesus, we do not do God's will. We do not do a lasting work. Paul told us that there will be those whose works will be burnt up. They will be saved, but their work will be burnt up. And so it's a way in which we can actually function on the peripheral uh, will of God. Um, We can function on the peripheral will of God instead of in the center of his will. You know, Paul talked about carnal, carnal um, Christians. Nowhere in, in, um, in Scripture do I see anything about God's permissive will. I don't see it. But the concept is there. If you read through Scripture, you'll see it. That those, there, there are brethren who served in the direct will of God and those who were on the board. And some who were just used as instruments in God's hands because they never submitted to God. So we want to make sure that we um, fulfill our call in the center of God's will. 
As Shirley reminded us last, a couple of weeks ago, it takes courage though to transfer from our natural abilities to trusting God. It is like uh, swimming or any of those things that are difficult. The natural thing is to walk. Uh, if we jump into water, it buoys us, but most people don't believe that, so we fight the water and we drown. <laughs> we have, it takes courage to transfer. There is in life, I believe, what is called a sweet spot in the will of God. You know, and those who use rackets in racket games, playing cricket, playing tennis, when you hit the ball just right with that racket, it is effortless. The ball goes with power, and I believe that there is a sweet spot in our ministry. It is a place where God enables us. His anointing is powerful. Our, everything aligns. Our abilities and everything that God has put in us aligns us to function at our best. It's a place where there is joy. And I'm not talking about absence of problems. I'm talking, I mean, you could be even a martyr, but you're in the midst of God's will and you know it. And you are in the sweet spot. And brethren, as we talk about this, we want we want to function as brethren out of that sweet spot. And having done that recap, and I hope I managed to stick to five minutes, but I don't doubt it. Um, I want to go on to the final two points. The other thing that God said to me is that whom God calls, God supports. And it's funny, you know, when God starts to speak, he speaks, he reinforces the message. This morning I heard from him. I really felt he started last week as I was preparing and just worshiping him in the morning in my devotions. He started talking to me about his love. And this morning he came with it again. And it is part of the same thing he was saying to me. We see out of Aaron's uh, and Moses' life that Moses has this uh, call. And God says to him, I'll go with you. But Moses still in verse 13 of Exodus 4 Moses still says, Lord, would you, after God has said, I'll go with you, and he has a supernatural experience of God. He says, would you send somebody else? Not me, Lord, send another. And God's anger burns against Moses, the scripture tells us. And yet our God is so loving and he's so gracious. He did not destroy Moses. You know what he did instead? He said to Moses, is not Aaron the Levite your brother? I know that he can speak well, and I will teach you what you shall do. So he shall be your spokesman to the people. God knows that we are in clay, that we are clay, Psalm 103. He knows that we hold this um, treasure in earthen vessels. He remembers that we are but flesh and blood. He knows that he is spirit, and he knows when he says he's going to go with us, we don't always tangibly see it or feel it. So what he does is that he brings others around us to love us, to care for us, and to help us, to encourage us, to serve us. So just before I go on with that, I want to just say to you for a moment, we kind of overlook Aaron, but I believe Aaron is a tremendous example of service. Aaron, Moses was in the palace while Aaron was a, serve, a slave, right? So there could have been some resentment built up. This guy is being looked after and I'm down here laboring. Um, Moses becomes a runaway murderer. And yet when God says to Aaron, go to your brother in the wilderness, was that a needle in a haystack? Did, did Aaron know where Moses was? Um, I don't know if God told him you know, to go, to, go to, um, to Mount, which Mount was it again? Horeb. Or whether it was to go to the priest of Midian. But the fact is that Aaron, not really knowing where he was going, went. That is obedience. And he went, and when he saw his brother, he kissed him. That is love. And when Moses said to him that he was to be now become his servant, really, he was going to serve with him. He, Moses, would be the leader, the younger brother. Uh, Aaron willingly went, and that is humility. And I believe, brethren, that, that's how God calls us two to serve each other. There are going to be those, the younger, the younger serving the older, but there's also going to be times when the older will be serving the younger. What is important is that we're doing what God has called us to do. So God puts us in this body together to be a blessing to each other. And I ask you, who has God put around you? Who is supposed to be helping you? 
who is supposed to be supporting you? But who is it also that God wants you to serve and to support? These are important questions. These are important things for us to know and to understand as we are walking towards fulfilling our call in Jesus. Hallelujah. I remember Bobby and I going into Trenchtown. It was a very important two by two. And Jesus sent out his disciples two by two. And when Bobby died, it was a blow to me. And I know God has put others around me, but there'll never be a replacement for Bobby. Bobby and I going together initially on that piece of ground. And what was accomplished, what God accomplished there through us. So brethren, let us rejoice that God doesn't call us to function alone, but he puts us in his body. I love the body of Christ. And it's very manifest, very manifest in the New Testament. You see it there. I remember, you know, um, Barnabas was a man who helped Paul to get to Jerusalem. And if you remember that, right, from Damascus. He took, he made the introduction to the, to the um, uh, what are they called? The apostles. Because everybody was afraid of Paul. In fact, he was still Saul. And the one who had been persecuting the church. And Barnabas made a way. Barnabas also, when Paul had to leave Jerusalem and he went back to Tarsus, Paul went for him in Tarsus, brought him back to Antioch. And it was there when they were among the brethren that the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereon to have called them. Right? And they went out two by two. But as, as they went on that missionary journey, Barnabas took with him Timothy. Not Timothy, sorry, my mistake. John Mark. Remember John Mark? Took John Mark, and John Mark uh, was not faithful. John Mark left them on the journey, and so when they were going out again, Barnabas wanted to take John Mark, and Paul said no, and a very strong dispute arose between them both. And John Mark, uh, Barnabas said, I am not leaving John Mark. Paul said, I'm not taking John Mark, and so they actually split up. And sometimes even a little dispute in the church is a good thing because that team multiplied into two, right? And what happens is that John Mark, Paul took John Mark and went with him. And it says that Paul chose Silas and went with Silas. And that is um, in, in Acts 15, right? And verse 40, you'll see that. Um, but you know that Paul rejected John Mark, but later on, when writing to Timothy, Paul says this, that send John Mark to me quickly because he has become profitable to me. He has become profitable to me. And do you know why that is? Because there was a Barnabas who was an encourager. There was a Barnabas who was a way maker. There was a Barnabas who never gave up on people. There was a Barnabas who took John Mark and helped him to develop to the point where Paul could say, John Mark is profitable to me. And we believe that John Mark is the same Mark who wrote the Gospel of Mark. Hallelujah! Who is it that you should be supporting? Who has failed? Who has fallen by the way? Who has turned back? Who has let you down? And you need to now go back and work with that person to help them to become the best they can be in their calling. Praise God for Barnabas is among us. But I just bless God because Paul worked with many brethren. And he went off with Silas. And what we see is that as these two went out on this journey, they go to Philippi. And in Philippi, they're beaten to within an inch of their life for preaching the gospel. They are thrown into the dungeon. They're put in chains. But together, brethren, together, two of them encouraging one another in the Lord. It says this of them, that um, they were yet um, praying and singing hymns. They were worshiping the Lord in the prison. To the point where the prisoners were captivated and they were listening. To the point where the Holy Spirit was captivated and moved in power and threw open the gates of the prison. To the point where... Um, the jailer said, I'm going to have to kill myself because the prisoners have escaped. And Paul was able to say to him, do no harm to yourself because we are all here. Who has ever seen prison doors open and prisoners stay where they are instead of running out of the place? They're usually trying to break out. 
not stay in, right? And so the power of the Holy Spirit, because they were together, uh, encouraging each other, worshiping in the Lord, then indeed, um, the <laughs> we saw the power of God come down and this tremendous miracle happen. And we see Paul continuing with the love of the brethren. But I want to just also say that for us now, here in this place, the writer of Hebrews says this to us out of 10, chapter 10 and verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Consider one another to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. But exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Brethren, let us stir up one another. Let us love one another. Let us support one another. Let us serve one another. We know that there are many who are even now overtasked, feeling the strain and the pressure. Even as I'm saying, fulfill your call. They're saying, Brother Richard, I am under pressure. I'm doing my best. You know, one of the things I realize, and, and the, the statistics have shown it, 20% of the people in the church do all the work. But we know that this fellowship is not going to be like that. We're going to find that every man, and make it round to the, at least the 80%, are going to take up the burden and do the work of uh, presenting the gospel and building the body of Christ. And the overtask will no longer be overtasked. But even in the midst of being overtasked, we can look to God and expect his strengthening and his intervention for us. Because God does not leave us alone, and he's going to put brethren around us who will support us and enable us. The final point that God made uh, in, in talking to me, he's saying finish the course. He said stay focused. Stay focused to the end. Don't become distracted. Don't become discouraged. Stay focused. And, you know, um, I wanted to say this to us. Isaiah experienced a supernatural call of God, didn't he? In the year that King Uzziah died, it says that Isaiah saw the Lord um, and his train fill the temple. He saw him high and lifted up. And it says that um, Isaiah realized that he was a man. He fell as one dead. He was a man of unclean lips. He, he needed salvation. And God brought the coal, had the angel bring the coal to him and cleanse his lips. And then God said to him, uh, who shall go for me? And Isaiah said, here am I, send me. <laughs> All of us have had that supernatural experience. We may not have seen a vision like Isaiah had. But God has opened our eyes and God has touched our hearts. That's why we're sitting here this morning. Because God, we have heard God's call and we have said yes to God's call. We have given our lives and we are responding. We're in that process. I want us to receive that. Some of us think we need to have flashing lights. God doesn't do that with everybody. He comes to different ones of us differently. I mean, I'd love to have had a Moses experience, but in many ways, I did have a Moses experience when God came to me, right? I didn't see the burning bush, you know, but Moses started in a, in a, a supernatural experience with the burning bush. Um, he had God actually revealing himself to him as he, Moses, asked God, who shall I say sent me? And God says, I am the eternal one, um, the everlasting God, the God whoever was. Um, he says the God who was creator, he had a revelation of God there, right? But Moses still needed more than the revelation. He started in that revelation. But remember that even as he was speaking with God, he was saying, God, I can't go, I can't do it, to the point where God became angry with him. And then he got to the place where God said to him, I will send your brother Aaron with you. And right away, Moses felt a difference. And Moses decided to go. Moses submitted himself. So I want us to know that we're not on our journey on our own. God will send those who will help us to go forward. But even as Moses rushed back to his father-in-law to tell him, he says, I need to go and check on my people in Egypt. And the father-in-law gives him permission to go. And Moses is going And I know that the slides are going ahead of me. But Moses is going, and 
he finds himself in a position where he is in disobedience. He's coming to obedience. I'm going, Lord. But there's still an area of disobedience in Moses' life. <laughs> there's still an area of disobedience. Oh, it would have been good to just back it up a bit. And then, uh, yes, thank you. Um, we can go to the point where we talk about the call on Moses' life. But it's okay. It doesn't really matter too much. So, the, the, the thing is this, that I am going to ask us to think, is there any area of disobedience in our own lives as we respond to God's call to us? Moses, I believe, was disobedient because he is part of a covenanted people. God is sending him to do a supernatural deliverance for his covenanted people. A mark of that covenant is circumcision. God said you cannot have an uncircumcised male in the breaking of bread, in the, sorry, in the, in the Passover. You can't have an uncircumcised male there. Um, one second. Let me just pray. Father, I just want to lift up my heart to you. Stop a moment. And just breathe and say, bless you, mighty God. Lord, deliver your word to your people, I pray. I come against every spirit of confusion. I come against everything that would distract now uh, in the mighty name of Jesus. And I thank you, Lord, that you are ministering your power and your might and your glory to us this morning in Jesus' name. And you're ministering it through us now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, we see where Moses... And I think I've lost my place. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. And so we see where Moses actually now is in disobedience. Because Moses is circumcised. The people he's delivering is circumcised. They have the mark of God's covenant upon them. But Moses is taking his family and he's carrying his son into these covenanted people without the sign of the covenant. His son is not circumcised. He is in disobedience. And I am believing that one of the reasons why Moses did that is because he did not want to offend his wife. I don't believe, as I read the scriptures there, it seems that his wife did not agree with circumcision, this mutilation of the flesh. And so in trying to please her, he was willing to go. And I believe it was, as the scripture says here, um, no, in Exodus 4.24, the Lord met Moses and sought to kill him, right? And then Zipporah took a sharp stone, cut off the foreskin of her son, and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you're a husband of blood to me. So he let him go. God released him when the obedience, when they, when they became obedient. Then she said, You are a husband of blood because of the circumcision. So obviously, Moses was not allowing, was not performing the circumcision because it was an offense to his wife. And it was when she saw that she was going to lose Moses, know that she did it herself and brought Moses into obedience and God released him to carry on with the mission for which he had called him. But it is also instructive to note that God was willing to kill him. Because there are some things we can do, only we can do it the way we do it. But there is always somebody else to do God's will. So we need to be aware of that. So Moses had to come into obedience. Brethren, is there, this is critical. God gives us prescribed ways that we must do things. David um, found that out when Uzzah died because he was trying to move the ark in a way that God had not prescribed. And so Uzzah died. Um, but God also speaks some specific things to us in our lives to test us and to um, see if we will come into full obedience and to strengthen us in obedience. Is there something that God has said to you in your call that you're not being fully obedient to. That is a hindrance to you fulfilling that call on your life. The other thing that Moses um, had to face was satanic obstacles. You know, you have to remember that we do not uh, war against flesh and blood, but we war against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. So as we walk, the, devil of our, the, the enemy of our souls, the devil is not going to want to... Um, 
to uh, give us free passage. He opposes God's purpose. He opposes God's will. And he will oppose us as well. And so you're going to find that we are going to have um, demonic opposition coming against us. But I want us to do like what Moses did. Moses endured. And when the demonic opposition came, Moses went back to God. Pharaoh symbolized for Moses demonic opposition. He was the orchestrator of the opposition to God's will in having the people set free. And God had told Moses that this man was going to oppose them. And yet when he opposed them, it seemed to have got to Moses, right? So that Moses, when he went to Pharaoh and told him to let the people go, and Pharaoh did not let the people go, then uh, Moses um, becomes a little discouraged. Um, in Exodus 5, 22, we see where Moses says, it, it, the scripture tells us that Moses returned to the Lord and said, Lord, why have you brought trouble on this people? Why is it you have sent me? For since I, came, uh, since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. And remember that what happened is, is that they used to get the straw. Pharaoh said, no more straw for you. You must make your bricks. And we're not reducing the tally, the quota. You have to make the quota. Um, and so the people were very distressed. I mean, they were put under some serious pressure. Um, their life was miserable before. It was now impossible, right? And so Moses felt depressed because he's doing God's will. But the people now uh, are put under pressure. The devil has, is working to bring pressure and disruption. I can just thank God that Moses got to the place where later on, when after one of the plagues, Pharaoh said, I'm going to let the people go. And Moses said, I know you will not let the people go. Moses came to the place where he knew he could press through. Supernaturally, God was going to give him the victory. He was no longer discouraged when the Pharaoh did not do what he was supposed to do because he remembered what God said to him before. He saw how God was working supernaturally in the lives of the people and against Pharaoh and against the Egyptians. And he got to that place. And I'm believing, brethren, that when the demonic obstacles and opposition comes, that we too will go back to our source and we will be strengthened to go forward. But not only did Moses have to deal with the demonic opposition, even from among the people of God, he got opposition. And you will see where, um, where when he left the Pharaoh's, sorry, when the, the taskmasters left the Pharaoh's palace from his own people, they were, they discouraged Moses. They came to him and said, you know, that you have brought all of this problem upon us, right? So from within his own people, he got opposition. But more than that, let me just tell you that there will be brethren who will be well-meaning and will discourage you in your call because they do not understand it. There will be brethren who are just jealous and get in, the, and get in your way. There are some people who are just bad-minded. There are all kinds of issues. We are in the body of Christ. We're not perfect. We're being perfected, right? So right even within the body of Christ, there are issues. And this is why we have to love one another fervently. Because we have to be able to forgive each other and walk with each other. And we will see where Moses, from within his own family, um, got opposition. As we see in Numbers um, 12 and verse 1. And uh, Brother David earlier was talking about the, the, the constant rebelling of the Israelites. In, in um, Numbers 11, you begin to see it. it starts in Numbers 11. They complain and they rebel. And right throughout Numbers, you this repeated rebellion that eventually caused them not to go into the promised land. But from within his own family, we see Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. They said this, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the scripture says, and the Lord heard it. And the Lord heard it. Now, as I was saying, all this rebellion that Moses experienced from the people one of the things the scriptures said is that Moses never opposed the people himself. It says that he and Aaron would fall on their faces before God. And it's God who would resolve. Sometimes in some dramatic and traumatic ways. Earth open and solar people, fire come down and burn them up. God fought for his leader, Moses. And here it is, his sister and his brother speak against him. 
We are the body of Christ, all of us here from the Lord. Particularly in the charismatic circles, we all hear from the Lord. And so it's something that we can become tempted to do, where we look at the leaders and say, who are you? I'm hearing God, what are you saying? Who tell you you can make any decision or say anything? It's something, a spirit we have to be very careful of. So Moses went and married this Ethiopian woman, and his family rose up against him. And it says that the Lord heard. But it says that Moses, uh, now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. And Moses demonstrated that, as I tell you, by falling on his face and not opposing the people. And so he does not oppose his brother and his sister. But what happens is that he, God hears, as we see. And God is the one who then calls them out to the tabernacle of meeting. Calls Miriam, Aaron, and Moses. God is the one who then declares judgment. He's upset. He asks them. He says to them, listen, um, prophets. I speak to them in visions, but I speak to my servant Moses face to face. Why would you lift up your hand or your voice against him? And it says that God was angry and his presence went up from the tabernacle. And when they looked, they saw that Miriam was leprous. And I believe that happened to Miriam because she was the eldest of them and probably the ringleader in this matter. And so she was the one who uh, got leprosy. And Aaron sees it and he says, Moses, have mercy on us and pray for us. Pray for, for Miriam. And so Moses, in his humility, prays for Miriam. But God says to him, she must at least spend seven days outside the camp. She must be put out for at least seven days. And then she can be brought back in. Let us be careful that as we serve one another, that no seed of rebellion rises in our hearts. We as leaders need to make sure that we don't generate um, seeds of rebellion. But we also, as believers together, need to ensure that we support each other, pray for one another. When we see an issue, let us take it to the Lord and not take it on the road and murmur and complain and Try and create havoc because it does not please God and the presence of God will lift. The presence of God will leave us. We will quench the work of the Holy Spirit. We will grieve the Holy Spirit. And that's something that we don't want to do. And then finally, in the remaining focus, there's one more thing that Moses experienced. We must be careful never to take the glory of God. We must be careful never, because God gives us great uh, protection, great favor. We're working miracles. We never begin to put ourselves in place of God. We must be careful. God, it says that Moses was a homeless man on the face of the earth. And yet there seemed to be in a moment in time when Moses shifted from that position. He took his eye off the ball. Brethren, we can't afford to do that. And it's not really just up to us, you know, keeping ourselves. It's up to us staying in God's presence and enabling the Lord to keep us, right? Moses experienced fantastically the presence of God, as did even the elders um, of, of Israel. You remember once God sat with them uh, by Horeb and ate with them, 70 elders. I don't know if you remember that. But... Here is Moses now in a position where God had told him at one point when the people were complaining, God had said, I will provide water for you through the rock. Um, take your rod, strike the rock, and out came the water, watered the people and the, and the cattle, right? So they are again in this position where they are in need of water, and God says, the people complain, Moses goes to God, and God says to him, Moses, Speak to the rock. I will honor you, and water will flow again out of the rock. But for a moment in time, very unlike Moses. Remember, Moses is a man who said, Lord, blot me out of your book for the sake of the people. Do not destroy this people, but rather blot me out of your book. He interceded for them. And here is Moses now uh, in Numbers 20 and verse 10 saying this. And Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. Because they had complained. And he said to them, 
Hear now, you rebels. Moses is now offended personally. Hear you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of the rock? Must we bring water out of the rock? <laughs> then Moses lifted up his hand and struck the rock twice. Not once, but twice. And God had said, speak to the rock. Very clear instruction. And he struck it twice with his rod. And the water came out abundantly on the congregation and their animals drank. Brethren, God went on to say to him, Moses, because you did not honor me before the people, you will not be allowed to go into the promised land. And eventually Moses ends his days on Mount Nebo, looking into the promised land but never entering. And God actually, you know, I don't think that Moses was a total failure. I believe that he, he is in the Lord. Well, we know because he came back and, and spoke to Jesus, didn't he? It wasn't it Moses and Elijah that was on the Mount of Transfiguration. So we know that Moses is there. But he never quite fulfilled the call in the way that God had wanted him to do so. Because he took his eye off the ball. And so God took, uh, brought home his servant Moses and buried him on Mount Nebo where no man knows. Um, so we too have to be careful as we're finishing our call. Never touch the glory. Never allow the offense to put you in a place where you begin to think that it is you. I am the one who is running these people. I'm the one, these people need me, and I'm going to do this thing or whatever. Any kind of thing like thinking of that nature. Always make sure that we honor God. It's because Moses failed to honor God here that, and, and, and God must have taken it very seriously that he would stop his servant Moses, whom we spoke to face to face. From going into the promised land. Joshua could still have led them in. And Moses could have gone along. Moses didn't have to lead. So, um, so he didn't allow him to go in. And I wanted to say to us this morning. Uh, I, I like what the psalmist says. Psalm 119.2 says. Seek me with your whole heart. It says. Call unto me or cry out to me with your whole heart. Praise him. And that is Psalm 9.1. Um, Psalm 91, praise him with your whole heart. And in fact, you'll see the Psalms constantly saying, it's more than one place in the Psalms that says, I will praise you with my whole heart. But what I like is where the Psalmist cries out in Psalm 86 and verse 11. And he says to the Lord, unite my heart to fear your name. God can unite our heart. You know what it is to unite your heart? You have singleness of heart. Singleness of focus, singleness of vision before God. And when the fear of God is upon us, we will not misstep. The awesomeness of God is upon us. We never can take his glory. We can never put ourselves in his place. There can be no other God. There is only one true and living God, and we are just his creatures. Even though he's elevated us, we're still just his creatures. He is the awesome God and the only God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, brothers and sisters, that to me was a very serious lesson. Very serious lesson that, you know, God spoke to me and he said, in finishing your call, just know. Keep your eye on the ball. Keep me central. Keep me glorified. And let no flesh glory in my presence. In the New Testament, Paul faced many obstacles, beatings, shipwreck, um, all kind of issues with the brethren, Jews opposing him, beatings and all sorts of things. But Paul finished the race. And this is what Paul says um, in, in um, 1 Corinthians 9, 26. He says, but I discipline, and this is verse 27, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. You see, God has been speaking to me. God don't speak piecemeal. He speaks holistically. And he says, a fasted life. A life where the appetites are controlled. A, a, a life where you are disciplined in your approach. When you take time to be with me on a regular basis. Right? So Paul says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself become disqualified. 
And then he, as we have read and heard last week, and I, I was going to read today, didn't read it. Um, it says in um, Philippians 3 verse 14, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Pressing always forward, forgetting the things behind. Don't let them hinder you. Press forward and press upward to the call of God in Christ Jesus. Um, and the, the writer of Hebrews in um, verse 12 and verse 1, and I'm just going to read this bit of it. It says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There will be discouragements, there will be obstacles, but we must run with endurance. You know, Paul said that, he told Timothy, he said, learn to endure um, hardship or hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. The life is not easy, but we have to keep pressing. And with God's help, we'll press through. How is this for a, a testimony? Reese Howells, one of the most famous intercessors, Welsh, Welsh intercessor, lived at, around the time of the World War um, II. And um, God had a very special call on his life. And so he would go to pray for people who are sick. God would send him. And he'd go and pray for the person, and he'd pray for the person, and the person dies. Would you be discouraged? God sent him to pray for somebody with that same sickness again, and this time the person lives. And every time after that, that he would go to pray for that particular kind of sickness, the person would be healed. But every time he prayed for some new malady that was unto death, the person would die. And then after that, so it is almost like God is testing him. Is it about you or is it about me? Is it about your, obe your obedience to me? Will you go and be embarrassed? Will you go and feel ashamed? Will you go and f allow, you know, I am God. I will determine whether the person lives or dies. I send you to pray, go and pray. And let me con be concerned about the outcome. Brethren, we'll have to press through many kinds of trials because God will test us and he will allow us to be tested. He wants to strengthen us in our faith. But if we will press through, brethren, if we will press through, then we will be able to finish like Paul. And we'll be able to say, as he told Timothy, and I really want to read the end, but let me read a little bit from verse 5. It says, But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. I want to remind us again that we are all evangelists. Some, we don't necessarily operate in the call and the office of the evangelist, but every Christian, he who wins souls is wise, every Christian is called to witness to the truth of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, and we are to be evangelists. So Paul is encouraging Timothy. He says, be watchful in all things. Let us be watchful as we're finishing our call. We uh, need to endure afflictions and do the work of the evangelist. Well, that was part of his call. But he was also a teacher and he was also uh, an elder. And fulfill your ministry. And then Paul says this of himself. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Let us be able to say that. That I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. And I have kept the faith. And finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness. Which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Where are we? Brothers and sisters, are we on the journey? Are we committed to finishing no matter what? Whether we are afflicted in the body, whether there are those opposing us, whatever is coming against us, are we ready to press through and to press upwards? Where are we? And so in closing, I just want to remind us, age doesn't matter. It's a season of our lives that we're in. That God has prepared you, but you need to be willing to be emptied of that very preparation so that your trust is wholly in God. So we are emptied and empowered. And then God supports us with putting people around us to encourage and keep us and enable us. And then we have to choose to remain focused to the end. 
Brethren, God has put a call on your life. Fulfill it. Live in your sweet spot. Find that sweet spot and live there and bring honor and glory. You know, when you're fulfilling your purposes, when you glorify God most, and do you know what the highest form of worship is? Obedience. The scriptures indicate it. The highest form of worship is obedience. So let us be obedient to our Lord and let us bring glory and honor to his name. I know, Lord, that, uh, um, brethren, that I've asked, what I've said here, you know, is words, and we have a life to live. And life can be very demanding and very hard. There's much for us to do, um, even just to survive in life. Make sure that there's food on the table, there's a roof over our heads, and so on. But God will make a way for us. What we have to commit ourselves to doing is to spending time in prayer, in the word, in his presence, in worship, and allow God. And even in the times when we don't feel we're hearing from God, stay the course with the Lord. He will manifest himself to us. I'm going to ask you to just bow your heads in prayer with me. I ask you to just bow your heads and... Um, Feel the Lord would have me just pray for us. But also I believe that Lord would want us to minister a bit to the body after this. So I'm going to just ask Pastor Carr and Elder Robert and um, even the worship team if they would just come and just minister to the Lord as we would just, you know, have to encourage us in his presence again. Let us pray. Father... Yeah, yeah, David, you can come. Lord, we want to just start by asking that you would, you have brought this body this far, and you have a special purpose for this body. For each one of us here, Lord, we all have a special role. You put a call on our lives. And so um, this morning, Lord, I'm asking that even as some of us have been battered, um, some of us may even be feeling bruised, that you'd by your spirit even minister your peace, your healing, the balm that is in Gilead, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would by your spirit enable us to maintain focus. And that, Lord, you would build in us the endurance that even though there are times when we feel we can't make it, we remember to be like Moses and come back to you. Remember to be like Paul and Silas and in the most difficult of times lift you up in praise and worship and bring your presence, Lord, in power into our lives. Father, we ask that you would make your word sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb to us. That it would be a strong desire that we would take time in your word, Lord, and that we would be able to take time, make the time, uh, push away all the distractions and Take time to be in your presence, worshiping, and Father, praying. Be on our face before you, mighty God. We are asking now, Lord, that you would empower us by your spirit. And I declare this victory over my brethren this morning, that we are not just asking for it, but it is done. It is so that every person here will come to the end, and they'll be able to say like Paul, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And like Jesus said, Tetelestai, it is finished. I have completed my mission. It is done in the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise your mighty God. Glory.